Ashura. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the first installment of the uh, HDSA Research Webinar Series for 2016. Um, glad you all could join us. Uh, today I'm going to be presenting a overview of the year in research for 2015 and take everyone through uh, not only the things that HDSA has done internally through their research programs, but also, most importantly, focus on some of the uh, exciting breakthroughs that are, are happening across the world in the field of HD drug discovery and clinical trial development, uh, clinical development for HD drugs. Um, so before I get started, I just want to, for anyone who is new to the uh, webinar series, uh, just remind everyone that we are recording this. So if you have to drop off uh, and um, want to catch the end of the webinar or you know someone who would like to hear this but couldn't participate this afternoon, uh, we are recording it and we'll be archiving it on not only HCSA.org but also on our YouTube channel. Um, I'll, you can ask questions at any time during this uh, presentation. Just go onto the menu on your right hand side of your screen. You should see a box that you can expand that says questions. And at any time uh, while I'm talking, just go ahead and, and type your question and if time allows, uh, we will try to get to as many questions as possible at the end of my presentation. Just click send and, and we will get it and, and answer at the end. As I mentioned, uh, we are archiving this. Here's just uh, uh, showing you where you can uh, view these webinars, but not only this, but um, our other webinars that we've had in the past. We've been doing this since uh, 2013, so we have quite a few uh, really interesting and still timely research webinars that you can view. And to view our YouTube uh, channel, if you go into the hgsa.org uh, website, you'll see in gray some small icons up the top right hand side of the screen. Just click on YouTube uh, icon and that'll bring you right to the webinars. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, we did have a webinar scheduled for February uh, this was going to be presented by uh, Teva Pharmaceuticals where they would be discussing their current clinical trial called Legato HD. Uh, unfortunately, due to some circumstances regarding some uh, recent uh, clinical trial observations with uh, adverse events in another clinical trial for, for multiple sclerosis with liquinamod, um, Teva's requested that they postpone this uh, for, for a future date. So, um, it's not canceled yet. I mean, we are postponing it and hopefully we'll get Teva um, uh, on this research webinar series soon to discuss this exciting trial. Uh, in March 16th, we'll have Daniel Wilton, who's a, uh, a postdoctoral fellow at Children's Hospital working with Dr. Beth Stevens, where he will present some really exciting work he has uh, going on involving uh, the complement or immune system uh, and how that may be driving disease progression in Huntington's disease. So stay tuned for that uh, in March 16th. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm George Orling. I'm the Senior Director of Mission and, and Scientific Affairs here at HDSA. And as I said, I'm really excited to um, give you an overview of what I think was a really exciting and promising year in the world of HD research. Before we get too deep into the HD research, I just wanted to provide a really high-level overview of HDSA and, and our year in review. Um, We'll be talking about some of these things as I go through my presentation, but um, we presented or, or launched our very first of its kind HD clinical trial matching service called HD Trial Finder earlier this year. Um, we've crossed over in, in just three years, we've awarded over $2 million uh, starting this year to uh, researchers around the world through our human biology project. Um, more than 800 folks attended our what is our 30th annual convention that was held in Dallas, Texas. And I'll just remind everyone that can, uh, uh, registration for our 31st annual convention, which will be held in Baltimore, Maryland, is open and you can uh, register for that on our website. In 2015, HDSA also uh, expanded its Centers of Excellence program. Uh, we did have 20 centers of excellence, and we've expanded it to 29 in 2015. By pro and in doing so, we provided uh, centers of excellence 
in eight new states that didn't have representation. We have more than now 170 support groups around the country and 56 social workers, HCSA supported social workers that are providing that day-to-day -day, um, support that HD families and patients need. On the advocacy and awareness front, um, this is actually outdated. Um, as of today, we have now 234 um, co-sponsors in the House of Representatives and 17 in the Senate that are helping to support our HD Parity Act. Now, uh, this is this is really monumental and, and more than uh, support than we've ever had in the past. We've had more than 18,000 Team Hope Walkers in our, our uh, flagship fundraising program, the Team Hope Walks, that have raised more than $2 million. So it's been a very busy and uh, successful year here at HDSA. So now I just want to talk, this is a little outline of what I'd like to talk to you about this afternoon, um, talk to you about our Centers of Excellence program relaunch. Uh, briefly touch on some of the exciting things going on in the HCSA research programs. Uh, just give you a, a very high level snapshot of what's going on worldwide in HD research. Uh, touch on some of the major uh, clinical trials that are currently ongoing in the United States for HD and close with discussion of a new HD cl uh, clinical research, uh, clinical trial resource called HD Trial Finder. In 2015, HDSA reorganized um, into form a new, what we're calling a mission team. And under the mission team, to, we've, we oversee the clinical care, such as the Centers of Excellence programs, advocacy, research, education, and all the support and services that are provided across the country. And we think that we now have you know, dedicated professional staff that are responsible and overseeing each of these, um, each of these specialties. And uh, we hope that in doing so, in unifying all of these, these important mission activities under one roof, one team, will provide better uh, support and care and, and resources to the HD families around the country that need them. In 2015, we, we, we've had the Center of Excellence program at HGSA for many years, back, in, back into the 1990s. And up until 2014, it's not been a uh, necessarily a competitive process in terms of being open to all institutions to apply. And that changed in 2015. So uh, we recognize that there are fantastic uh, clinicians and caregivers and uh, health professionals around the country that are, are setting up HD clinics and HDSA wants to recognize these outstanding uh, care providers with their with our designation of as a center of excellence. So we've created um, a new program, uh, rebranded re the program uh, and created new funding level designations for, for um, our HCSA centers of excellence. And here you can see the, the three levels, one being a regional care center with a, a higher number of patients, 150. Uh, uh, there's a level two, which is more of a traditional single site center with what much have, which must have at least 75 patients. And then we also, created a, a newer level three, which is intended to be a smaller HD clinic. It may not have all of the resources that some major uh, uh, academic medical centers may have. They may not be involved in research. That's not a requirement of these smaller centers, but they are, if they're still providing expert and um, expert fantastic care to patients, we want to recognize. Them. So that's a level three center of excellence. All of these centers, uh, both level ones and level two, must be involved in HD clinical research. So we want to make sure that we have our eye in the prize in terms of HD the cure or the treatments as well as HD care. And this program is overseen by a, a volunteer-led committee at HDSA called the CPAC, which stands for Center Programs and Education, Ad Education Advisory Committee. In 2015, as I mentioned, we expanded to 29 major uh, 29 centers of excellence, up from 20 in 2014. This introduced two, 11 new centers of excellence, um, and two centers of excellence that were longtime uh, centers lost designation. Uh, in, in 2015, we committed nearly $800,000 to this program. Here's just a map and a listing of, I uh, hope everyone can see this, of what our 29 centers are. In the blue on the right 
are the 11 new centers that were not designated previously. And what you can also see on the left is our coverage in terms of the states that actually have representation. We've been able to expand from 17 states to 25 states uh, through this new pro through through this relaunch of the program. And in fact, tomorrow, as long as the weather holds out, we will all be here in New York City uh, evaluating the 20 what will be the 2016 Centers of Excellence. So stay tuned for that in February of, of uh, 2016. HDSA has a very active uh, and expanding HD research uh, program. One of my favorites is our Donald A. King Summer Research Fellows, and these are something that we give out each year to bright young uh, undergraduate science majors or first-year medical students to really attract them into the field of research, give them a really meaningful summer research experience working with an expert HD researcher somewhere around the country. And so we, we provide them with a, a small stipend, and salary, and, and actually some research budget provided to the institution uh, so that they can do the research and, and get uh, involved and get exposure to what it's like to work in the lab and uh, most importantly on HD. This is an active, we are actively recruiting, uh, soliciting applications for this and I'll just point out that you can learn more on our website and that the deadline for this, uh, this program is March 4th at 5 p.m. So get, if you know anyone or you're interested, uh, share this with them and get make sure their applications are into us by March 4th. Last year we awarded three of these fellowships uh, to these really bright young uh, future HD researchers shown here. One's a first year medical student, Patrick Hogan at Rush Medical College, um, and uh, another Hogan, Rogan Grant who was at Haverford but worked in the summer at University of Pittsburgh with a gene therapy specialist, Joe Glorioso, who's actually worked on development of a, of a CRISPR-Cas9 vector for knocking out Huntington. And CRISPR-Cas9, is, I'm sure most of you have heard a lot about this in the, in the news. It's a really up-and-coming, exciting um, technology that could, you know, eventually down the line bear fruit and be useful for, for helping us uh, in treatments for Huntington's disease. And finally, Brianna Bible, who is a student at St. Mary's College, uh, was working, uh, had actually a transcontinental um, collaboration with Steve Finkbinder, who's out in San Francisco, and Vanessa Wheeler, who's in Boston at Mass General Hospital. So very exciting work. We've completed, in 2015, we've completed our third year of our human biology project. This is our major um, research program at HDSA. These are one or two year grants that we provide to young scientists to work with uh, clinical centers, clinical care centers anywhere around the world. Um, and the, mo the most important part about this program is, as its name implies, the Human Biology Project. It's not to understand Huntington's disease in a fly or Huntington's disease in a monkey. Not that that's not important. It is important and it has its own utilities. We, we think our resources are best um, reserved for understanding HD in people, and that's what we look to support with our research dollars. This is open to researchers around the world. Um, we just made awards in, in late October of, of 2015, but in March we'll be opening this up again, um, and the applications will be due sometime in July of 2016. We awarded seven of these fellowships in 2015. I won't go through all of these, uh, but there's some really exciting um, exciting work being funded by HDSA from the creation up here, Amber Southwell, the creation of uh, sensitive tests or assays to detect the, the bad Huntington protein in fluids, particularly cerebral spinal fluid of HD patients, um, down to uh, Marie Didio, who's a, a fellow at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, who will be working on developing doing some work in helping to identify the next generation of uh, oligonucleotide or, or gene silencing based therapeutics. So very exciting work um, being done by our HDSA research fellows. Those research fellows joined the nine that we supported in 2014. And, and as these researchers uh, and their data become uh, more mature, we'll be certain you'll be seeing more of these uh, extraordinary researchers at 
HTSA conventions and research webinars like this where they'll be sharing their works. Our research commitments continue to grow at HTSA and, and I have no doubt that in 2015 we'll see this number uh, based on our HTSA uh, expenditures or total expenses increase up from back down in 2012 of 8% to over 21% in 2014. So we have a strong commitment uh, to, to HD research here at HDSA. At the very end of the year, we actually launched a new research program, a grant opportunity for uh, individuals. And this is really to try to get to something that we think is very important, and that is making sure the pipeline of researchers and clinicians is full for the future generations. You know, this HD is not going to go away tomorrow, unfortunately, and we need to make sure that, um, you know, there are scientists and clinicians there to care for the families or to continue the exciting research that's going on today in the future. And that's what we're doing here with this Berman Topper Family a Career Development Fellowship that we just announced. It's, it's unlike anything else that I'm aware of in, in around the world for developing and providing resources for uh, young scientists interested in HD research. We will provide them with uh, a three-year grant upwards of uh, up to $80,000 a year um, to really develop them into the next generation of HD researchers. And this is a, a live active program. We're soliciting applications until March 14th of this year. Details on this program as well as the Don King Fellowship that is also active can be found on our website. Um, let's just move on to that's what's going on here at HCSA in terms of research. But now I want to focus on more of what's going on around the world. This, I love this slide because I'm, I'm, I'm having to shrink these icons more and more each year. It's getting more and more populated and hopefully next year we're going to have to go to two slides. But this is just a, to give you a sense of, of who, and this is not everyone, but the, uh, a listing of, of some of the major pharmaceutical and biotech companies that are now interested in pursuing HD as a potential indication in their business model. Um, 10 or 15 years ago, this you wouldn't need a third of a slide to show this, and you wouldn't recognize most of the names of the companies uh, on there. And, and most of those companies that were on pursuing HD 10 or 15 years ago no longer exist. But we see some, ma we have commitments from major pharmaceutical companies like Teva and Pfizer and Roche and Ionis to and Genzyme to, to pursue their put their resources um, to bat against HD. So it's very very exciting. At the end of 2015, this is what the pipeline looked like. Um, up on the top is a very crude, simplistic um, representation of the drug discovery uh, and clinical development pipeline. It's not that simple. I wish it was, but for our purposes, let's. Um, just pretend that it starts in basic research and target validation. It moves into preclinical before put the humans uh, research and development, which involves you know, making that drug better, making sure it's safe, and, and figuring out a way to manufacture it. And then once they've done all that, it moves into clinical development or into people. Phase one being a safety study, typically, and which is making sure the drug does no harm. A phase two, which is like more of a proof of concept that let's see if this, how this drug does in people with the disease we want to treat, Huntington's disease. And phase three is more a larger, uh, more pivotal study, uh, typically the final study before registration with somebody like the FDA or the EMA in Europe that determines whether or not the drug can be approved for use in humans. And this is the also, once again, not a complete pipeline, but uh, most of the major uh, companies and their drugs on the right that are being developed uh, in the stage at which they, uh, you know, they are in terms of clinical development for HD research. We have one drug that's been approved for the, by the FDA for use in HD patients, that's tetrabenazine. But hopefully uh, by the end of the year we'll have two. And we know that the Auspex, now Teva drug SD809, has been submitted an NDA, a new drug application has been submitted and must be uh, reviewed by the FDA no later than uh, June 1st, I believe, or May, May 29th. What's 
So that was the pipeline and, and, and what's happening in the background is there's a lot of basic research that's going on across the world to help us better understand HD. And this is a very busy, complicated slide and not intended to go through all of this, but it's to point out this is just looking in the, uh, the different types of cells in the brain. And um, research has been going on in these gray boxes to figure out what exactly is Huntington doing normally and what does Huntington do when it's expanded or mutated uh, or elongated um, to cause harm. And researchers are we're, we're getting smarter and smarter and learning more and more about the things that Huntington is doing here in the cells. This is the medium spiny neuron in the middle. This is the neuron that dies first in HD. But it's not a medium spiny neuron disease. Huntington is everywhere. Huntington is in the cortical cells. Huntington is in these supportive cells called astrocytes and microglia. And it's causing harm in these cells too. And we're getting smarter and smarter to understand what it's doing. And the point of this slide is really to show that Huntington does a ton of things, which can be frustrating. But I look at it as a positive way is that by, by figuring out each new thing that Huntington does, we are now identifying a new way, a potentially druggable way that we could intervene, design drugs to um, slow down what, what mutant or expand the Huntington is doing. So is, there's a lot of work going on, but this is a lot of opportunities for, for us. And, and work is being done in all of these gray areas, these gray boxes, to, to de develop potential drugs for HD that aren't on that pipeline that I just showed you. So it's very, very exciting. There are, for years we focused on the brain. Um, with, I believe in the past couple of years we're seeing a very important transition in HD research where we're, we're moving beyond the brain. As I mentioned, H, Huntington gene is in every cell in the body, from your eyes to your toes. And the more we look, the more we see that Huntington is, is disrupting pathways outside of the brain, potentially in the muscle, for instance, or in the heart. And um, so research, other approaches are, are in development at various levels of discovery to uh, correct HD in non-brain tissues, non-central nervous system tissues like muscle and heart. Here's just a list of some other drugs or approaches that are being tried um, currently uh, for HD. And the point Another point I wanted to point out before I go to the next slide is just that in Huntington's disease, we have a, a, a great strength, but it, one of the interesting things about HD is we know exactly what causes the, the disease, and it's the, the inheritance of the mutant Huntington gene. So we all believe, um, and we, we're very confident that by removing that gene, um, we, we could potentially improve or delay the onset uh, improve symptoms or delay the onset of the disease, but we're not putting all our eggs in the Huntington lowering basket. There are, if we don't know if that's going to work, we're hopeful it will, but we don't know. But the idea here is that there are a lot of other approaches in the pipeline um, that will hopefully help HD that don't involve the lowering of the gene. We've, if you've gone to an educational event or maybe even HDSA convention, you've seen this slide. This is something uh, we all hopefully know very, very well. And what this means is that um, we've seen that when the number of CAG repeats in the Huntington gene expands and it gets larger, uh, it's inversely correlated with the age of onset, meaning as the CAG repeats increase, the age at which an individual uh, manifests symptoms motoric, primarily motoric symptoms shown here of, uh, of HD, they get younger. Um, so we know that pretty well. But there's a caveat. There's much more at play when looking at this slide than just the Huntington's disease gene. There are, as you notice, um, there are individuals that have 50 or 60 CAG repeats that develop the disease at the age of 20. There are also individuals out there with the same number of CAG repeats of 50 that develop the disease near 50 or 60. So why is that? Why do we see such variability? Um, wouldn't it be great if we could identify some of those factors at play that are delaying or even potentially accelerating the onset of disease in, the, in, in HD patients? And the answer is 
in genetic modifiers, potentially in genetic modifiers. And 2015 was a year of um, this term, and, and, and there were two outstanding papers that came out where scientists identified these modifiers, these genetic factors or changes that they found on in DNA, um, in the genome, that may alter the clinical onset of HD. The first paper came out in May by um, Christina uh, Bekanovich, who was formerly at uh, University of British Columbia working with Blair Levitt and Michael Hayden's groups. Um, she's now at Karolinska Institute in Sweden, but they published a paper where they found what's called a SNP, an SNP, which stands for Single Nucleotide Polymorphism. And this is basically a change in uh, a DNA change uh, um, in terms of code of the DNA. And they found this change on the HTT or Huntington promoter. This is a piece of DNA that lies just above, um, uh, to the left of where the Huntington gene is. It, it drives, it's basically like a, uh, a stoplight, you know, it drives the expression of the Huntington gene or can slow it down or accelerate it. Um, so that's what the promoter is doing. It's promoting the expression of Huntington gene. And they found that when this SNP, this DNA change, was on the normal Huntington gene, on the promoter of a, of a normal Huntington gene, remember we, most people have a normal, you get two copies of each gene, one's a, a, in, in the case of HD patients, in most cases it's a normal gene as well as the inherited expanded gene. And when that SNP was on the normal gene, they actually saw that these patients had an earlier age of onset than would be predicted. But when the SNP was on the expanded Huntington gene, they had a later age of onset, indicating that potentially, you know, this, this SNP causes a disruption of the Huntington promoter, which would cause a decrease in production of the Huntington gene. So in the case of the expanded, if you had the mutation on the expanded promoter, you would, in theory, potentially make less of the, the bad gene, and that could explain the later onset of the disease. Conversely, um, when the, the mutation is on the, the normal gene, you're making less of the normal protein, which we believe is good. It serves a purpose, and that could be playing a role on earlier age of onset. This could be evidence, you know, to suggest that so, you know, allele selective or, you know, or specific silencing Huntington uh, may be, uh, should be, or may be very important moving forward in the clinic. There's also a landmark paper that came out from the, what's called the GEM Consortium in July of this year. Uh, this is a group led, the paper was led by uh, Jim Gazella and Marcy McDonald and, and John Ming Lee out of Mass General Hospital, but this really involved hundreds, collaboration of hundreds of clinicians and researchers around the world. This study involved thousands and thousands of human DNA HD samples. And what they found were similar DNA or genetic variants on two different chromosomes, chromosomes 15 and 8, um, that could, the one that was found on chromosome 15 could actually accelerate HD onset um, by six years, and the variant that was found on chromosome 8 could, actually, could um, accelerate the disease by 1.6 years. In addition, uh, the expression of another variant on chromosome 15 that they found could delay the onset by nearly a, half, a year and a half. So that's kind of shown. Um, that's kind of shown here in this blue box below, where you could have, um, you know, good or bad modifiers, and that's what they're showing here potentially in the GEM consortium is that you could have things that could uh, cause a change and have an acceleration, uh, a delay onset of, of motoric onset, or a modifier that could actually accelerate. So we want to, uh, the GEM consortium doesn't, has not identified what these genes are. Uh, they are working hard to do that, but the, when they do, these could be potential. The importance of this study is that these, could, these variants and what genes they lie on or reside in could be potential uh, drug targets for uh, HD uh, drug hunters moving forward. A really exciting approach, since we were talking about allele sele selective silencing, might may be uh, a really important path forward for, for HD research, is a technology being developed in partnerships with Sangamo uh, Biosciences and Shire Pharmaceuticals. And this is targeting the Huntington DNA using these things called zinc finger proteases. These 
are kind of shown below, it might be a little hard to see, but they, they really look like little fingers that are coordinated by zinc ions. And they have been designed to, uh, to bind to the Huntington DNA. They recognize the CAG repeats in the Huntington DNA, and they can bind to it very specifically. And by the addition of this, of a, some sort of gene repression domain, um, they, they have different molecular tricks where they can actually turn expression of a gene on or actually activate it. Um, so this group, Sangamon and Shire, are working to develop a way to selectively silence the mutant Huntington gene. And what you can see here on the right is these are actual patient, human patient, HD patient cell lines. Um, all four are on the right here are uh, patients two through five are different HD patients with 70, 67, 45, and 44 CAG repeats in red. And then you can see in blue their, their normal gene. So each patient has a bad gene and a good gene. And the point of this is uh, that their technology can selectively eliminate the bad gene, the red, in all four cases and leave the normal, the blue, untouched. So this is, this is really exciting data. And, uh, not in the clinic yet, but we're hopeful technology like this will, will be in the clinic in the coming years. Similar to our human biology project, where we hope to better understand uh, HD in people, there's a clinical study, a clinical platform designed to better understand what's going on in people. And that's called Enroll HD. This isn't new for 2015, but it's, it's continuing to expand, and it's a global what Enroll HD is a global longitudinal uh, observational study of HD. Um, and it's a platform for where we believe all future HD clinical trials will be performed. You're collecting, uh, this platform's collecting data, a uh, common set of data for all HD patients or participants around the world. Um, they're collecting samples that can be used by researchers to help identify uh, new genetic modifiers potentially or help validate future targets for HD drug development. As I mentioned, it's a global effort. You can see here in green all of the different countries where enroll sites are, are now present. Uh, and as of the end of 2015, there were over 8,500 participants at uh, 128 sites in 14 countries around the world. And I believe this is approaching 9,000 at the end uh, as of January 1. H, Enroll HD is a family study, um, and, and it's not open just to gene-positive symptomatic patients like most uh, interventional uh, drug trials are. This is open to them, symptomatic, but also gene-positive pre-symptomatic patients. They're gene, uh, those who are at risk and don't know or don't want to know their gene status are also invited to participate, as are gene-negative uh, family members, spouses, and partners as controls. Enroll HD, in one word, is a magnet. It's a magnet for these companies when they're looking to, you know, put their drug assets to work and, and are considering HD as a potential indication. They want to know where the patients are so they can figure out if their asset works in HD. and, and um, by having a, a registry, a platform of HD patients where we know a lot about them and track them over, over time, this is a really attractive magnet for these companies to, to come and, and test their, their resources. 2015 was an awesome year for uh, drug, disc uh, drug approvals with the FDA. Uh, this is a, a plot here of the past 10 years or so. Um, and 2014 was a really good year, and 2015 was even better. And this is just in the CIDR, which is the Center for uh, Drug uh, uh, Exper Experimental and uh, I'm not blanking on it, but um, this is the group at the FDA that's overseeing small molecule discovery. Um, and it, they had 45 different drug approvals, new molecular entities approved. There were also an additional uh, six at the Center of Biologic uh, Research that were approved. So 51 in total actually were approved in 2015 for, for, by the FDA, uh, which is 
the best in over 20 years, best year in over 20 years. What's really exciting is that uh, you know these are not all for cancer and heart disease and diabetes. 47% of the novel drugs that were approved, so 21 out of those 45, were approved to treat a rare or orphan disease. So companies are in fact working and developing uh, new new drugs for uh, for diseases such as Huntington's disease. And I apologize, the name of the CEDAR is, is the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, not Experimental Research. So that's a little bit about what's going on uh, around the world in, in terms of exciting things that happen in terms of HD research. Now I just want to talk a little bit about clinical trials. Uh, and before I do so, I just wanted to spotlight that in September of 2015, we had a really uh, unique opportunity for the HD community to come together and be heard by the Food and Drug Administration down in Maryland. Um, in 2013, there was a uh, call for uh, requesting for groups or disease areas to request a meeting with the FDA. And the FDA was going to select 20 disease areas to have patient-focused drug discovery meetings with the FDA over the span of a few years. And we were really excited to hear that uh, HD was selected as one of those 20 disease areas. Our meeting was scheduled and, and was held on September 22nd down in Maryland. And uh, it was a half-day event. We, did, we had a, the morning session, and we were followed by Parkinson's disease in the afternoon. And we really, it was, it was really a fantastic day. Um, we, we blew Parkinson's disease out of the water in terms of attendance and participation. We had well over 150 attendees in person, more than 120 attended via webcast. And the, the attendees were, were treated to two panels of, of HD patients and caregivers that discussed their experiences with the symptoms and current treatments that are available for HD patients. And that was really the point of this uh, and goal of these patient-focused drug discovery meetings was to educate regulators that are going to be approving the next HD drug about the symptoms of HD that matter most to the patients and the caregivers or the families, and also what risk are they willing to take to stop them. You know, the risk that you might be willing to take, be willing to take to stop Korea um, associated with HD may be very different than the risk you're willing to take uh, to stop some of the aggression or depression associated with HD. So uh, the outcome of this meeting, is, and we're awaiting it, there will be a report. It's called the Patient Voice, or Voice of the Patient Report, and we are awaiting this report any day. And when it is released, we'll be sh sure to share it, news of it, on, on hdsa.org. In early 2015, from the clinical trial perspective, some really exciting data were presented by OSPEX on their drug, Osteto, or SD. And Osteto is basically a, a derivative, a, an analog of the already approved drug tetrabenazine shown here on the left. And they've done a little a unique um, trip where they've basically made it um, deuterated or uh, radioactive. And by doing so, that changes the, the dynamics of this drug, the, the characteristics of this drug, and the way the body handles this drug so you can dose it potentially less often and it may have fewer side effects. Um, the point here is that um, the drug, SD-809, had sig very significant improvements uh, on a number of pre-specified motor endpoints in Huntington's disease, particularly in uh, TMC, which is total maximal chorea score. Interestingly, it also appeared to have fewer side effects, and if you just focus on uh, this blue percentages here of the percent of patients in the trial that uh, had different side effects ranging from sedation down to vomiting compared it, that received the SD-809 drug versus those that received tetrabenazine. You see there's a far fewer percentage of patients that uh, exhibited these side effects on the OSPEX drug. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, this, the new drug application or NDA was submitted to the FDA in May of 2015, so an FDA decision must occur no later than, I believe it's May 29th of, of 2016. So stay tuned for that. 
results from the Raptor Pharmaceutical SysHD trial were announced late in 2015. This was a French trial, a 36-month study looking at 88 patients, uh, testing their drug called cystamine. And cystamine is thought to be working in HD through a number of different things. It may, um, I believe it's working to potentially uh, increase free radical scavenging causing an you know, increase in this thing called glutathione, GSH, by decreasing the reactive oxygen species, or ROS. It could be, uh, they believe, maybe increasing BDNF, which is basically like a fertilizer for the brain, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's a good thing for the brain, and we know it's down in HD. Um, so there are a number of different things that this drug, cystamine, they believe is doing that could be playing a role in improving survival in HD. Um, Unfortunately, this study, CIS-HD, failed to show uh, improvement in their primary endpoint, which is the rate of change in total motor score. They did see some improvement in independent scale, which is a part of the UHDR, UHDRS. Um, so uh, the point here is um, this, these results will not move forward towards a, an approval of this drug, but more than likely a much larger phase three clinical study will be required to see if this drug, RP103 or cystamine, has any utility in patients. So stay tuned for that. Another drug that just wrapped up uh, recruitment for H in HD clinical trial was the PRIDE HD study. This is a dr uh, study being sponsored by Teva Pharmaceuticals. Um, this is a drug that's been around for a while. It used to be known as Hontexel or ACR16. It's formerly uh, owned by neuro, a company called Neurosearch. Teva acquired this compound and started a study called Pride HD that began in April of 2014. Um, the primary endpoint of this study was to see if the drug had any improvement in total motor score, TMS. This drug had, it was in previous clinical trials. Some folks may have even participated in it, uh, called Heart and Mermaid HD. These were phase three clinical studies looking at this drug, predopidine. Uh, and uh, in fact, in both of those studies, it did significantly improve total motor score in HD patients, but that was not the primary endpoint of either of those studies, so it failed to get FDA approval. Um, in this current PRIDE HD study, total motor score is the primary endpoint, a primary outcome they're looking for, so um, this recruit the recruitment of the study is now complete, which we're happy to say, and we expect initial results uh, any day now. So hopefully by February, we expect to hear some readout of the PRIDE HD study. To mention, we were supposed to have a webinar next month on Legato HD study. This is another Teva Pharmaceuticals clinical trial that is currently recruiting. This is a study that's testing uh, liquinamide, which is an anti-inflammatory drug for the brain. Um, there is evidence that there is increased inflammatory response in HD brains. But as well as other neurologic diseases. Um, so the concept here is that by providing this anti-inflammatory, modulating the immune system in HD patients could have a benefit. Um, this is a study that just got started in late September of 2014. Um, and, and as I mentioned, there were some uh, cardiovascular side effects observed in this drug in a multiple sclerosis study that's also ongoing. Um, so there will be some, certainly some protocol adjustments um, to the Legato study moving forward. So stay tuned for that, but the, the webinar for the third was postponed. But as soon as we know more, um, I'm sure we, we will certainly share that with you. Another study currently recruiting um, is the Pfizer Amarillo study. This is a study, a phase two study in the United States as well as in Canada, the UK, Germany, and Poland. Um, uh, this is testing an inhibitor of a drug or an enzyme called PDE10A or phosphodiesterase 10. Um, phosphodiesterase 10 is this enzyme in the brain that controls um, the way neurons are talking to each other, signaling to each other. Um, and we know, we see that in HD, this, these green kind of kidney bean looking structures inside the brain are, this is actually PDE10 in the brain. And this is mapping directly onto the striatum of, each, of, uh, of the brain. And we see that what we know is PDE10 decreases over the time course or the progression of HD. There are, there, 
is evidence to suggest that further inhibition of this enzyme may actually be uh, have show improvements in, in symptoms associated with HD and, and uh, uh, so that's the, the kind of rationale behind this study is that by inhibiting PDE10, we may uh, improve motor, but they're also looking at different secondary endpoints such as cognition and behavior and brain atrophy via MRI. Uh, this study we hope is going to be completed by the middle of this year and patients are still needed. Uh, we recently had a research webinar on the Amaryllis study and, and at the end of 2015 and and just like this webinar today, you can be found on our, our YouTube channel. There was another study called the SIGNAL study, which was initiated by a company called Bacinex. This is a phase two clinical trial for people who are at risk and have early signs of HD. Uh, this is unique in that it's not testing a small molecule or an antisense oligonucleotide, but it's actually testing an antibody. An antibody that binds to this protein, recognizes a protein called semaphorin 4D or semaphor-D. I, I show you here what semaphorin 4D is. It's the signaling molecule. The point here is that um, the hypothesis about this beyond this trial is that by inhibiting this signaling molecule, you could potentially reduce CNS inflammation, uh, increase neuronal outgrowth, which could all be good things in HD. end of last year, um, the company formerly known as ISIS became IONIS. Um, and that was noteworthy and, and, and we're, I think we're all very excited that and relieved to see that the name was changed. I know that I, I in all of my communications, I would always spell out pharmaceuticals after spelling ISIS. So I'm, I'm very relieved that we now have a new name to, uh, to call this great company, IONIS. Um, but they've changed their name to IONIS and they have the really the great, most exciting news I think coming out in 2015 was the launch uh, of their phase 1B safety study for their gene silencing drug to target Huntington. So in the second half of 2015, uh, IONIS launched what will now be IONIS Huntington RX, um, uh, launched a safety study, a phase 1B safety study in HD patients. Um, is to test their ASO. And the way ASO works is that this is sh shown here in red. This is their ASO. It's actually a piece of DNA, basically, that will bind to the messenger RNA, the messenger RNA of the Huntington gene, basically the recipe that makes the Huntington protein. And when this ASO binds to the messenger RNA or the recipe, it prevents the protein from being made. It prevents the meal from being made. So. Um, by decreasing the protein, we, we hope that we'll see a slowing or a halting of disease progression in HD. This is not your typical drug. So this drug is not taken orally or intravenously. It's given via uh, intrathecally, which is just a fancy word for lumbar puncture or a spinal tap in, a, in the small of your back. Um, initially, this is going to be dosed, is being dosed in just 36 patients, not in the United States, and will be observed, they'll be observing them for up to you know, greater than a half a year. But uh, it's, it's what's exciting about this is this is the first time in 2015 we saw the first time or a first drug that was specifically designed to target the gene that causes Huntington. This is a, uh, you know it, it's gone into HD patients. This is the first drug designed specifically with HD patients in mind. So it's very very exciting. Finally, there are a few other uh, additional HD clinical studies that are ongoing. There's non-pharmacological approaches like DBSHD using electrical stimulation deep in the brain to try to treat chorea associated with HD. This is going on in Germany. Much like the H Enroll HD study observing um, HD patients uh, and adults, there's a kid HD and JHD study, observational study in children that's being run by Pagnopoulos at the University of Iowa. And Later this quarter, we hope to hear more about a NeuroNext trial. This is called, uh, going to be called STAIR, which stands for SRX246, um, that's the drug, Safety, Tolerability, and Activity in Irritable Subjects with HD. So it's a company called Azavan, has a drug that is an antagonist, kind of an inhibitor of a, a protein called vasopressin 1A. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that by inhibiting or antagonizing that protein, you'll have impact irritability and aggression. So this is a study that's being started 
uh, is sponsored by the, the National Institutes of Health. We've got a number of different sites in the U.S. and will hopefully start up later this quarter. Finally, uh, I just want to close with, uh, you know, I've talked to you about a, a lot of, the good news is we had a lot of different clinical trials that are ongoing or wrapping up um, for HD, and that's great news. But in the past, we didn't really have a, a forum or a venue to figure out more information about these trials or how you could get involved uh, in any of these trials. One of the ways that folks used to use it, or used to go to, is, is or may still use, is clinicaltrials.gov, which is a, a government site. Um, if you go there today, it's going to show that you have 800, actually not 834, I went there today, and it says you have 893 different Huntington's disease trial options. And we know that's kind of ridiculous. There are not 893 trial options or studies for HD patients. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of things to sort through on that site. And so what HDSA has done is develop this new resource called HD Trial Finder. And it's a clinical trial matching service, um, which is online. So it's all web, it's web-based. But we've also released, late this year, we released a call center component. So if you're not tech savvy and you really want to talk to a human being, you can call 866-890-6612 Monday through Friday and actually talk to a real live human being that will help you um, develop your profile, match you to a trial in your area, and kind of walk your walk you through the process. It's really easy to to access this. You can get there through our website hsa.org or by typing in hdtrialfinder.org. And once you go there, you just sign up for an account, which just requires your you know a name, first name, an email, and a password. Uh, you create a profile, so, so you give your zip code and, and say who this account is for. It could be your patient, it could be your, yourself, it could be a loved one, uh, and then answer a very short 10 or 11 question questionnaire about the patient. And, and by doing so, you'll be matched, you'll be given your personalized results about clinical trials that you match to that are in your geographic area that you're willing to go to. This is what your output would look like. This is, uh, you would find the, the, the phase of the different studies, uh, the title of the clinical study, the drug that they're testing, um, as well as the different locations. Uh, you can change the location if, uh, by clicking here on change location. But the, the most important thing here is by clicking the contact icon, the phone icon, you're going to get the name, the phone number, the fax, the email, uh, the institution of the person that you need to contact to, get, to learn more and get involved in the study. So that's hopefully an exciting resource to, uh, you know, that we've launched and with the call center component at the very end of the year that we hope that patients and families will find useful as, the, um, as we move forward into 2016 and beyond. Because we all want, we all share one common goal. We all want effective therapies for HD uh, yesterday. Um, and the only way that, that those, that's going to happen is by through clinical trials and the only way clinical trials are going to happen is through participation by the HD community. So hopefully this will, will help you in, in getting your information and, and answer any questions that you may have. So with that, I will close up. Sorry I ran a little bit long, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to try to answer them. Um, let's see. Uh, one question, how can I get someone to come out and educate the staff in the facility where I work? We do have residents that have diagnosis of Huntington's disease. Uh, a great question. So um, we can certainly try to help you out with that. So if you contact myself, uh, you can call me or email me and we'll, we'll find out where you are and see if we can't have some folks do an in-service to your, your facility to try to um, educate the caregivers about Huntington's disease. Um, are you aware of any gene editing work being done with HD? So, um, you know, I think it's really early stage for the gene editing, and maybe this question is referring to the, uh, uh, what I alluded to, the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, technology that's been hot in the news. Um, everyone's been talking about it because it's really applicable to almost any disease. Um, it's really, really promising. It's really, really early as well. So uh, it's very effective. and, and 
as you can see, we're, we're funding a, a summer research uh, fellowship to develop these technologies to knock out Huntington in a cell. Um, that can be done, uh, but for editing the human genome, the Huntington gene in uh, all the cells in the body, that's a big hurdle, and, and we're not there yet. But uh, it's certainly something we're, we're, we're watching, and uh, it's, it's very promising. But in, in no way, shape, or form is, are things like CRISPR um, close to entering the clinic for Huntington's disease. Um, why the big increase in drug approvals in 2013 and 2014? I, I don't know. I mean, it's a good question. Um, and uh, I would love to maybe get someone from the FDA to, to try to answer that, but I, I, I don't know. Um, what the answer for that is. Uh, one question, how quickly will this webinar be online? Hopefully within a week or so. Um, we will try to get that on. Give us a, a few days and we'll, we'll get it on, on YouTube and on our website. Um, with with alongside of the clinical trials, are, are patients also working with physical therapists and nutritionists? Absolutely. Um, uh, that there are things that certainly that are things we recognize that could be done to help the quality of life of HD patients. And we suggest that you, you know, by going to, for instance, the NHGSA Center of Excellence, where they have all of these PT, OTs, nutritionists on staff at their site. Uh, and available for, for consultation um, suggests that they can certainly be there as a resource to help you. Um, are doctors and researchers finding new data that shows that slowing down the disease process with the, cor with the corresponding uh, physical therapist? Uh, there, there, there's not, not that I'm aware of, but there certainly are evidence uh, in, in animal models of, of HD that um, you know, exercise can delay the disease progression, and it only makes sense that uh, diet and exercise and things like that will have a beneficial effect in HD. Um, can you be in multiple trials at the same time? Yes and no. You can be in enroll HD and an interventional study at the same time, but you cannot be in two different interventional drug studies at the same time. Um, could, you clarify, could you clarify COE support in the Atlanta, Georgia urban area? I was unclear per your map. Um, sure, there, there is a, a, a clinic at the uh, Emory University that is, um, it's not a cent an HCSA center of excellence, but it is a, a place that Folks can go in the Atlanta uh, suburban area to to get really outstanding HD care. Um, have the O'Briens inside the O'Briens book helped or hurt or had no impact on lobbying and awareness efforts? I mean, it certainly helped us, and we're working closely with um, the author Lisa Genova. Um, here at HDSA to help raise awareness, and she's been fantastic to coming out to different events and speaking about HD and helping to raise awareness. And in fact, uh, at the back of her book, there's a call for action for her readers where they've, she's uh, set up an online page where they, uh, donor, uh, readers can donate to HD Research, and I think we've raised about $35,000 towards, um, that would from readers that's going directly to support the Human Biology Project here at HGSA. Have there been any qualitative studies showing ways to make the lives of patients with HD more enjoyable while we wait for the drug studies to produce more options? A great question. Um, and, uh, you know, nothing that I, I'm, I'm not thinking of anything off the top of my head, but this is, this is something also that we had, this exact question is what we had in mind when we developed the Human Biology Project. It takes 10 to 15 years to develop a drug for HD, but firmly believe that there are things that patients and families and caregivers could do today 
that will, it's not going to stop HD, um, but it could certainly improve the lives, the quality of life of, of both caregiver and patient. And we want to hear about those ideas desperately. So if you have ideas, um, let me bring them to, a, to our attention and, and consider uh, trying to test them out through the Human Biology Project. Um, uh, one question is asking about, do I recommend being tested? Uh, I, I'm, I don't recommend nor, I, I won't really recommend testing or not testing. That's a really a personal question um, about whether you want to know. So I, I really can't, nor I don't think anyone can answer that but the person at, you know, at risk for HD about whether or not they should be tested for HD. Um, how can my site be considered, I guess this person from a clinical site, be considered for future clinical trials? I think um, get active in the re HD research community. Um, you know, I think try to participate in, in, in things, you know, global efforts like Enroll HD, um, that you can show that there's a patient population. Um, like I said, Enroll HD is the magnet for these companies, and if uh, there's a patient population that's present in your institution, then it certainly would uh, probably be considered for future HD clinical trials. Um, when's the moving co movie coming out for in Inside the O'Brien's? I don't know, but I want to know because I want to be in it. Um, even if I'm an extra. No, I really, we really don't know, but hopefully there will be a movie. Um, and if there is, we will certainly let you know. Somebody wants to have lunch when they're in New York City? Let's do it. Sure. Call me, email me, and we'll do lunch. Um, that'd be great. Anyway, that's, I think that's pretty much. Uh, one, one final question. Are there scholarships available to Cana Canadian graduate students working on HD? Um, yeah, absolutely. So our, our, our Berman Family Fellowship, as well as our Human Biology uh, Project, are open to researchers not only in Canada and the U.S. but all around the world. So if you have an idea, I'd encourage you to apply through that program. So uh, just a couple minutes over, I want to thank everyone for participating. And if uh, there's any questions that you think of or I neglected to answer, please email me. You can email me at g-yorling, g-y-o-h-r-l-i-n-g at hcsa.org, and I'll be uh, do my best to get back to you and, and uh, answer any questions you may have. So thank you very much for joining us, and I hope you join us for a future research webinar, which right now will be March 16th, uh, where Daniel Wilton from Children's Hospital in Boston will be, be presenting on the role of complement in the immune system in uh, HD disease profession. So thank you very much, and talk to you soon.